How many people do you know can wirelessly take a picture on a DSLR camera through their 3D printer activated by a cell phone? There's one. All right, guys, let me tell you where I'm at. So you can see the Ender 3 is uh, quite functional running uh, the Duet board with RepRap firmware. And um, yeah, I'm gonna making the video uh, about that as I'm making this video, all kind of in tandem. And you know, it just takes three times longer to make the video than it does to do the actual project. And um, I wanted to sort of upgrade my capabilities here on this channel uh, as far as cinematography goes. You know, there's this uh, time-lapse technique that everybody's using these days to film their um, to film their, their prints being made. And let me just uh, show you that this camera over here just has a much better uh, sort of view of the bed. And what you want is this exact shot that you're looking at where every time it takes a photo, the print is sort of slid away and so you don't have this uh, end effector moving around, or I'm sorry, the X carriage moving around. And it just, it just makes for great cinematography. So um, yeah, I'm actually in the middle of making that. and. There's a number of ways to do it, but what I wanted is to have a nice clean printer. This is, you know, a work in progress, but when it's all done, I want a nice clean printer with no wires hanging off of it. And I don't want to use Octoprint with a, a webcam because um, the webcam just isn't as beautiful as the, as the, you know, the depth of field photography that I can get uh, using my nice Canon cameras. So I need a way to trigger the Canon cameras without wires. And that is this thing right here. So there's a whole lot of these that you can buy. You can get them for Nikon cameras and Canon cameras. And basically it's just a little uh, infrared remote and you press the button there and it triggers the shutter and you're good to go. But we're gonna take this thing apart and hack it. So you can see that what I do is I pry off the sticker and the front and the sticker serves double duty. It's both a, um, a button, you see all the buttons and it's also a, um, you know, a decorative panel. So taking a look at this um, PCB that gets popped off, we can see that on the back side here, we have the, um, that's where the buttons, that's where the little dome buttons sort of complete the circuit. And on the front side, we can see a bunch of little um, test points. And what you wanna do is figure out whichever button it is that you're accessing and solder a wire to each of those two test points. And then you wanna run that wire outside of the, um, the case here. So that is exactly what I've done with this one right here. Should be able to see that, there you go. Um, so this just basically has these two wires coming out of it and it's just a single button that when I press that, it causes the shutter to go. So what I wanna do now is wire this into the Duet. And in order to do that, I'm gonna use the uh, fan pins here on fan pin number two. Uh, so the fans go zero, one, and two. So there's actually three pulse width modulation controlled fans. and um, this unit, um, I've tried to power it through the Duet and just run the whole little microcircuitry in here off the Duet. It doesn't work. You have to kind of keep the battery self-contained and it makes the project a whole lot easier anyway. Um, so what you would need to do then is connect both of these two leads uh, to the ground, but one of them needs to be switched. And thankfully the negative terminal on the pulse width modulation fans is uh, switchable. But here's the problem. It's got what's called a pull down resistor circuit on it, which means that it never gets to absolute zero. It always has a slight little bit of grounding to it. And so you just cannot get it to work connecting these two leads directly to the board. You have to add a, this is one of these um, relay circuits. So uh, this is like a dollar. These are super cheap, but the relay circuit needs to be powered. So we're gonna connect that here and then we're gonna connect the signal line to the fan switch. And then we're just gonna connect the, uh, the lines coming out the other side here from the normally open switch and then the common. And that right there is everything we need to remotely trigger the camera from uh, the Duet. So let's just show it working here. Um, I have a button on my phone that I've added. It's the take a picture or take a photo button right here. You can see it right there. 
And if I just press that, we're gonna hear the relay click. Every time I press it, it's taking a photo. Now, I don't have either of these cameras currently set to be triggered by this, but that was sending a, um, a signal to, uh, to take a photo. So I'm ready to go. All I have to do now is modify the G code um, in my slicer software or do a post-processing post -processing, uh, you know, activity to basically insert G code that says, hey, take a photo. Well, first it says move the machine to this orientation and then take a photo. So easy day. Uh, so the only thing left to do now is I want a little um, sort of bracket that's adjustable to, so that I can aim this remote in any direction that I need to so that I'm not you know, married to a certain camera position. And this will just give me fantastic capability as far as uh, making good cinematography. You're not gonna see that jerky head movement anymore um, in, my, in my videos. So let's, um, let's make that bracket, print it up, and watch the time lapse. So here's the setup, all working flawlessly. The camera is being triggered by the remote right there, and the printhead moves up and out of the way when it's time for a uh, photograph to happen. There is the uh, relay, which is triggering the remote, connected to the duet board. Of course, I need to clean up the wiring, um, but it's, it's just working, guys. I could not be happier. Like, I couldn't be happier. It's, it's really exciting. Um, 
the only like criticism I could give to myself here is that this unit isn't as good as it could be. Uh, it's perfectly functional. Uh, you see I can aim the remote wherever I need to so that I have a nice line of sight between the camera and the remote. Uh, that needs to happen. So um, that's that was the whole point of of that ball and socket mechanism, but you know, uh, could be better. Design prototype test, maybe I'll make another version of it. The final pieces to the puzzle that you guys will need in order to uh, duplicate this project at home are the computer work. So here in my browser, I'm in the, um, you know, the web interface with the, the Creality Ender 3 now that it's running the Duet board. And on the left here of the, of the web interface, we see the macros uh, folder or you know, menu item. So we're gonna go there and we're gonna make a new macro. We're gonna call it take a photo. And here in the, uh, in the actual space for writing the macro, we're gonna put three lines of G-code, just three simple lines. The first is an M106. Now normally that turns a fan on and off, but because we are connected to the fan pin, uh, we're just gonna say, so it's turn fan two, P2 and turn it to 255. That's um, that's basically all the way on for a pulse width modulation channel. So basically it says turn fan pin on at full blast. Wait, the G4 is a dwell command. So it says dwell for half a second, 500 milliseconds, and then turn fan pin off. That's all we're doing. So these three lines here simul simulate me uh, hitting the button on the remote with my thumb. So that's all we need right there, save those changes. And now if I go to machine control, so this is sort of your main interface for the Duet uh, now, um, or through for the Ender 3, and we'll see right here in my user defined macros, there's the take a photo button. That's the button that I was using at the beginning of this video. Okay, so that's all well and good with the control interface, but now what we need is a, um, to modify, uh, we need a print file. So we need to modify that print file. So here in Notepad++, you can see that um, I've expanded on the, here's the three lines we just wrote, and I've expanded on them slightly. Basically, I just caused, the, I called the pause um, macro, and I also called the resume macro. Now the P98 calls a macro, P98P, and then you put the name of the macro that you wanna call. So I could actually call, take a photo here, Uh, but yeah, you could do it that way. Um, I don't recommend deviating too much. It took me a bit of work to figure out how to get this functional just right. So you will need to put this G60 S1 and that saves the uh, last print coordinate, um, like the last actual on the print as it was extruding you know, filament. It saves that last coordinate into memory before you call the pause button. Now, uh, it's complicated, but that's the way you need to do it. So just basically copy this G-code to your clipboard. Now, here in Kira, um, we're going to basically just export the, um, the G-code file, the print file. You could do this with any uh, slicer software, I think. Um, now, Make Anything recently produced a video where he showed you how to do this within the slicer software if you're using Simplify 3D, which I love that program but um, I'm just showing you guys how to make it happen with almost any um, slicer software. So save that G code and then open it up in Notepad++. So here we are, Notepad++, and we can see right here on line 22, there's a layer, so it says semicolon layer colon zero. Now, I don't know about other slicer softwares, but almost everyone that I've seen has some sort of a cue that their layer is, is moved on to the next layer. There's some sort of consistent sort of like comment there. So we're gonna use that comment. And the way we're gonna do that is we're gonna go Control F and we're gonna mark here. We're not gonna, so we're gonna go with the bookmark line. So you want that selected. And then we're gonna just do semicolon, L-A-Y-E-R colon and mark all. Close that down. So now we can see there is a little blue dot, and you can put these on manually if you wanted to, but there's a little blue dot next to every layer change. So the next step is to go up here to search, and you go to bookmark, and then paste to replace. And that was just the G code that I copied a minute ago. So now every time that there's a layer, uh, layer change, we're gonna get that code instead. 
and that's the code we need uh, to move the printhead out of the way. That's what the pause function does, moves the printhead out of the way. This takes a photo and then we resume the, uh, the print. So that's all you need. Save this and run that file by, uh, doing, by calling it through the Wim interface. So let's just do that right here. Here in G-code files, we'll just upload a G-code file and we'll make it this one. Takes a minute to upload, but once it's complete, hit close and then click on it one time. It says, do you want to print it? And you just click yes. And that's all there is to it. So um, you're now off to the races and ready to make awesome time-lapse photography with your 3D printer. Now this geometry that I created, I will of course post it on Thingiverse. The reason I printed it in so many pieces or the reason I designed it for so many pieces is because you don't have to use any support material and you don't have any overhangs this way. So it just makes for a very clean sphere. And of course these parts just thread into each other. Um, but like I said, there's not quite enough tension on the fork here holding the ball. So it tends to be a little bit floppy if you uh, kind of get it wrong. You might be able to fix that by putting a rubber band on the fork or something. But um, at this point in time, I'm not going to spend the time to, uh, to get that, you know, perfect. But it works for me. And like I said, could not be happier. Uh, expect to see much nicer time lapses on all of my videos from here on forward. So yeah, that's about it for this video. Thanks for watching. See you next time.